I'm going to give a wee talk for 20 minutes on, really on the theme of how we as a society have lost control over our environment and over our land and over the decision making about our places. And in the process of that, uh, have lost a lot of our sense of our place and our sense of our place in our place, uh, if you see what I mean. Um, uh, and so I'm going to start by, by running through a bit of history. And then I'm going to be talking about two important themes. One is money and the other is uh, governance. Uh, I can't move very much. So now I hope this, um, well, this is my recent book. And what's interesting actually is that um, when you write a book, the publisher gives you a cover and a photograph. And this is a photograph. And uh, I asked the publisher where this was. And he said he didn't know, but he gave me the name of the photographer who's the head of history in Huntley Academy. Um, and I went onto his website and discovered that this house here, which is another abandoned ruin, uh, is up Glengairn in Aberdeenshire. And it's one of a settlement, a place called Ardach. There used to be 14 houses. They are population of 50. There was a school and there was a shop and there were two churches. Uh, and then Ardach began ringing bells for me. And then I realised that Ardach was also the place where my, great, my wife's great, great, great grandfather's brother was the parish priest uh, for 60 years in Glengairn. And for all I know, this may well be uh, his house. But it's a little bit of an allegory, really, for land in Scotland. Now, I'm not sure if this will... OK, could you press just the bot? Yeah, brilliant. Thanks. I'll just... Um, I just a little bit background on me. Uh, I used to work when I left school as a stalker's gilly. Uh, this is me. Um, a stalker's gilly is somebody who goes out in the mountains with a pony and uh, the posh people shoot animals and we stick them in the back of a horse and take them back home. And in the process of that, process of that one meets a lot of posh people and talks to them as a daft wee laddie. And in the process of that, I learned a lot, which has taken me where I am today. And I can't go into a lot of that. It involves naked members of the royal family frolicking. <laughs> <laughs> That's the next book. <laughs> yeah. Next. Uh, now, for a little bit of context on this, land is not just about the kind of romantic notion of the highlands, and etc. Land is vital to our very economy. This is a picture of the Allied Irish Bank on the banks of the Liffey in Dublin. Next. Now, Ireland is a place where, in 2006, George Osborne, our dear Chancellor, went to Ireland. And this is what he wrote in the Times. He said, a generation ago, the very idea that a British politician would go to Ireland would be laughable. The Irish Republic was Britain's poor and troubled country cousin, a rural backwater. Today, things are different. Ireland stands as a shining example of the art of the possible in long-term economic policymaking. And that's why I'm in Dublin, to listen and to learn. Uh, a year and a half, Ireland went belly up. Next. Uh, in 2010, this is what the Financial Times wrote, at the height of the lunacy, around three quarters of the total lending of Irish banks got bound up in property construction and land speculation, a sort of northern rock on steroids. So I just mentioned this at the beginning because it's important to remember if you don't manage your land properly, your country goes belly up. Next. Now, one of my early uh, um, uh, heroes in all of this was this man here, Tom Johnston, who was Scotland's wartime Secretary of State. And he wrote a great book called A History of the Working Classes in Scotland. And he had a great chapter on the reaving of our common lands. Uh, and he wrote that adding together the common lands of the boroughs, uh, the royal boroughs and the boroughs, the extensive commons of the villages, uh, and the hamlets, the common pasturages and grazings, the commons attached to Runrig, we should be rather under than overestimating the, com estimating the common acreage in the latter part of the 16th century at fully one half of the entire area of Scotland. So when I first read that, I thought, what's happened to it? And uh, since then, I've been trying to find out. Now, I'm going to run through a bit of history, and I think this slide might put me in danger of my life in terms of getting out of Renton. No, it'll be the next one. So can I just ask your <laughs> indulgence? <laughs> I do quite admire Robert the Bruce, but in the context of the story of Scotland's land, it's important to remember, sorry, yes, the next one, I do want the next one. Um, it's important to remember that somebody like Bruce was merely a noble on the make, um, and his ambition to obtain the crown of Scotland was simply that, an ambition, a burning ambition. Uh, it was not to liberate Scotland, uh, it was to obtain the crown. Now, in the process of which, of course, he entered the history books and he did liberate Scotland and we wouldn't be where we are today without... Well, we would be, but we'd probably be contentedly English 
and not really complaining too much <laughs> about what happened 600 years ago. Um, and to my nationalist friends who, who, who criticise, this is the title of chapter three of my book, you see. I say, well, what of murdering and medieval and warlord do you actually disagree with? But anyway, the point of this was the first big land grab in Scotland was when the crown got its hands uh, on the country and feudalism was introduced and the king owned the whole country next. And that meant that by 1400, the whole country was parceled up in baronies and lordships. Uh, etc. The second great land grab was when the nobility got themselves in in the, the old church in Scotland as commendators. They were the chief executives of the abbeys and they handed out, the abbeys at that time, the church was very, very powerful. It had an annual income of about £380,000 a year compared to the crown's income of about 17000 It owned extensive lands across Scotland. And in the first part of the 16th century, many of the nobility got their sons and, and nephews in as commendators, and they were the people that kept the books in the abbey. And over a period of about 40 years, starting in 1510, uh, they gradually gave life rents, i.e. a rent for life, to their fathers and uncles and the nobility. And then there was an act which converted these life rents into feus. So they slowly stole the lands of the church. And so when the Reformation came along in 1560, the Protestant nobility were behind John Knox for the simple reason that they had stolen land. And if John Knox succeeded in getting rid of the old Kirk, uh, they would be secure in those stolen lands. As it happens, they weren't terribly secure because Charles wanted to restore Episcopalianism in the beginning of the 17th century. And that was a major stimulus for the nobility uh, to introduce the law into the picture and to further secure uh, their property rights. And they did this by establishing a register of seizings in 1617, which is still there. And those of you who own property, many of your properties will be registered in that register. And then the fourth land grab at the end of the 17th century, having got their hands on the lands of the, of the church, uh, they decided to go for Scotland's remaining common lands, which were large areas of land in Scotland's parishes. Uh, and they did that by passing an act in 1695 that allowed the nobles, the landowners in a parish, to divide it amongst themselves. And in this parish and many parishes across Scotland, the land was divided up amongst the owners in the parish. The fifth land grab uh, was the borough commons because they were exempted from this division in 1695. And this was, again, large areas of land next in Scotland's boroughs. Next, we'll skip that one. Uh, in Irvine, for example, in Ayrshire in 1820, the yellow shows you the amount of land that Irvine owned in 1820. Next. And the borough lands of Scotland, of course, are where today, in fact, very, on this very day, Hoyk common riding is taking place. Um, and this is today a sort of celebratory event, but historically it was a necessary event for the uh, townspeople to ride around the marches of the town's common lands to ensure that the Duke of Buccleuch and Roxburgh and people hadn't encroached on what were very, very valuable lands in a royal borough, because if you owned land in a royal borough, you were a vassal of the crown and you had the vote. Next. And indeed in Aberdeen, this is one of the boundary stones of the freedom lands of Aberdeen. Uh, Robert the Bruce granted the freedom lands of Aberdeen to the people of Aberdeen. 14 miles in circumference around Aberdeen were given to the people of Aberdeen as their common land. Uh, including the Denburn, the Denburn Valley, the Queen's, uh, the, 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 the Union Terrace Gardens as they are now, which is a great stushy in Aberdeen about uh, their future. Next. And the problems in the boroughs really started in 14. 1869, when they had annual elections in Scotland's boroughs, uh, but some boroughs stopped holding these elections and the common people began rebelling against this and having riots in the street. And so they passed an act which, instead of insisting that they have annual elections, actually decided that the council of the borough should be elected, uh, should be chosen by the previous town council. So you'd have an elected town council which next year or in two years' time just chose the next one and together they would choose all the officers. And that continued till 1832, borough reform. So you had 450 years of rampant nepotism and corruption where the councillors just chose their own successors. Next. And that meant that a lot of common land was lost in our boroughs, including places like St Andrews here, uh, where the golf links are part of their famous commons. Uh, and the town council went bankrupt as a result of this nepotism and leased out this golf course to a local rabbit farmer who introduced lots of rabbits. Uh, and the rabbits created new holes for the golfers and uh, new bunkers and hazards, which the golfers for a while actually thought was quite cool, uh, but eventually they began destroying it. Uh, and there were the rabbit wars in St Andrews where there were riots and there was actually pitched battles and there were weapons and blood was shed. 
And eventually a local landowner came to the rescue and gave, gifted the town council some money to allow them to buy out the lease of Mr Dempster. And so today we have the, um, these famous links. And of course in Edinburgh, when we built the new town in Edinburgh, uh, that was bought by, la by money in the Common Good Fund of the City of Edinburgh, which used to be a huge Common Good Fund, very, very wealthy. Now it's virtually nothing. So just a few stories about where we are today with Scotland's Commons, and I thought I'd just illustrate this by two examples. One is the hill of Ailith in Perthshire, eastern Perthshire, just on the border with Angus, next, where on the hill of Ailith, north of the town, uh, there is an old common. Now, in 1922, the Earl of Airlie owned all the land around the hill, and all the farms were tenanted, and he decided to sell them to the sitting tenants and he sold them to the sitting tenants. But not only did he sell them their farms, he also divided up the hill and sold them bits of the hill, which he had no legal right to do so. But nobody knew about this because the people of Ailith were not in the habit of traveling to Edinburgh and checking on all the title deeds coming in the doors of the Register of Saisons. And I'll come back to this in governance next. But after the war, when the farmers started getting grants, um, uh, public grants for farming, the first thing they did was put fences up between their new lands. The folk in the town noticed this and they went up and had a protest uh, on the hill on a Sunday. The next Friday, the local town councillors went up and committed acts of sabotage, cutting the fences, uh, and they were arrested by the Ailith Constabulary and held overnight in the cells. Next. And that's just one wee example of a place in Scotland which has been trying to recover its common lands, uh, not successfully, I have to say, and most of this story is a sad story. Um, this is a piece of common land I discovered in Lanarkshire in the parish of Curluk, just a wee 30 acres here in the yellow. Could you go back one, please, if you wouldn't mind? Uh, and I found it in the middle of the, of, the, of, the, of the hill there. Next, and what was interesting about this was actually, this is not just any old piece of land, this is in the middle of Europe's largest wind farm. And so had the folk in Curlook knew, knew that they owned a bit of hill land, they could have asked Scottish Power to put a turbine on it. As it happens, they didn't know anything about their common land. In the last year, we've, been, we've actually tried to record a title to this. I don't know if it's successful or not, but the people are now trying to re reclaim the common land. And this is it here in red, this wee piece of land, surrounded by this big uh, wind farm. Next. Um, so I want now just to talk a little bit about money, because money is important, and money is one of the reasons why we've lost control of land. The game of monopoly was invented in North America and Virginia, and it was called the landlord's game. And it was invented to prove that if you allow monopoly ownership of land and the collection of private rents, uh, a lot of folk will end up poor. And if you played monopoly, you know it's a very dispiriting game. You play it for two days and you end up thoroughly depressed. <laughs> um, but the landlord's game, as it was invented, had two sets of rules. One was the rules we play. The other was the single tax rules, where people were taxed on the land that they occupied and bought with their monopoly money. And those games went on forever and never ended. And people ended up with lots of hotels and houses, and everyone was reasonably equal and, and equally wealthy, and they all had property. Next. I do apologise for this graph, but I think it really is very, very important to understand what's happened in the last 20 years with property in Britain and around the world. Remembering, of course, that the, this, the financial crisis we have started in America with the selling of mortgages to poor people who could not afford to pay for them. And when the poor people said we can't afford it, the bank said, well, you choose your interest rate for two years. So they said 0%, please. And then the smarter of them thought, well, what's going to happen at the end of two years? And the bank said, don't worry, buy a house now for $200,000, it'll be worth $250,000 in two years. Sell it, give us the $200,000 back, you've got $50,000 in your pocket, cost you nothing, buy another one. So they went along with this. And of course, nothing, this did not happen. Uh, and they couldn't afford, and then these debts were all securitized and chopped up and sold around the world to financial institutions so that when the American property market collapsed, all the banks around the world were sitting in these assets uh, that were worthless. So the property, the financial crisis started with, with property. And what's been happening in Britain, this is only since 1987, but certainly since the 1970s, we've built up massive private debt. Public debt, that's the stuff that David Cameron's very worried about and why we're all facing lots of austerity. That's the light blue on the top, 81% of GDP. The really scary debt in Britain is the dark blue, 219% of GDP. That's what financial institutions owe. That's the banks and investment companies and the people that have been buying all these speculative uh, products. They owe 219% of GDP in debt. 
The light blue is business and industry. They do useful things, at least they kind of make things. And we can reasonably expect that as long as they continue making things and there's a market for them, they'll pay it back. At the bottom, 98% of GDP, that's you and me. We are mortgaged up to the hilt. By 2015, we'll have 2.5 trillion pounds of debt, of which 90% is secured on land, our houses. And we have no prospect of paying that back, frankly. Certainly if interest rates rise. So we're sitting on a mountain of private debt, all caused by uh, a massive bubble, massive, massive asset bubble. And the reason for this asset bubble is because the money supply, and this is from 1963, along the bottom there, you can see the amount of cash in the economy. That's notes and coins in your pocket. That's virtually been unchanged. But since about the, the mid-1970s, the amount of total money, that's the blue line in the economy, has gone up exponentially. And all that money is electronic money created by the banks when you go and take a loan. So you ask the bank for a loan of £1,000, they just magic it out of thin air. They write £1,000 liability and £1,000 in your account. They've magicked up money. And it's the growth in that private debt-based money that has meant that we've had this property boom and speculation, mainly on land, which is why land prices are so high, and it's why Ireland and, and now Spain are going down the swanee. Next. And that's what's happened uh, with houses. Earnings and building costs at the bottom have stayed stable, but house prices, and particularly land prices, have been on a roller coaster. Next. Now, things are very different in countries like Germany, for example, where 56% of people live in tenanted houses. I can go to Hamburg, I can get an unlimited tenancy for as long as I like for 8% of my income and stay there. The best I can do in Edinburgh is six months. You can't bring a family up in a six-month tenancy. Now, in Germany, 42% of their banks are owned by local government, the local government banks. They're owned by your local council. 26% are local cooperative banks and credit unions. So 70% of the banking sector is controlled by people through their democratic local government or their cooperatives. So these people have not been engaged in highly speculative ventures. We've only got one local bank left in Scotland, which is the Airdrie Savings Bank. And I just want to finish to talk about governance, because that's money, and it's important that we regain control over our money supply, mainly by relocalizing it and stopping allowing commercial banks to issue it uh, as private debt and instead get government to spend it directly in the, con in the economy, building houses and bridges and hospitals and schools and all the things we want. Governance is important. We've lost control over our environment. And one of the reasons for this is we've actually abolished local government in Scotland. Next. This really came home to me a couple of years ago when I cycled through Europe. And this is in the Luther Museum in Lutherburg Witterstadt in what was Eastern Germany. Luther pinned his famous theses to the wall and rejected the old Kirk and the power of Rome. But he also uh, uh, initiated a, a political revolution. He said that all the tax that the church was collecting and all the rents would no longer go to Rome, but would go to the town. And it went into this chest called their common good chest. So in 1520, they started a local welfare state in Wittenberg, where the money was used to pay for uh, the education of children, and it was used to pay... Uh, 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 widows and, and, and widowers uh, and they had a rudimentary health service in 1520 because they captured the rents of the church. Now if you look at uh, 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 the continental Europe you'll find in countries like France that their local government is very very local, the French communes or the Spanish municipios. And you'll find in France they have 38,000, 36,000 local government units, 36,000 municipalities. Italy's got 8,000, Norway's got 400, we've got 32, covering an area of 11 and a half, 115,000 uh, population and almost 1,000 square kilometres. We've got the most concentrated, undemocratic pattern of local government in Scotland. And that's what we've got on the left, and that's what we should have on the right if our parishes still form the basic unit of local government, as they do in France and Norway and Germany and Italy. Next. If our parishes, and we abolished our parish councils in 1929, we abolished our town councils in 1975, uh, 200 of them. If our parish councils were still in existence and had powers, for example, you pay your income tax in Denmark to your local municipality, yeah, and it passes it up to Copenhagen. Here we, put, we give it to London, and then we have to claw all back. And whenever it gets to our existing local government, they've got no freedom to spend it, because they've been told by central government to freeze the council tax. And so their only flexibility is parking charges and library fines. And you can't run decent local government when you've got no control 
over your local tax base. Next. Uh, and this is reflected in things like forest ownership as well uh, in, 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 in Scotland and in Europe. Uh, in Europe at the bottom, you've got a very, very uh, widespread pattern of forest ownership. Most of the forests are owned in pockets of less than a hectare by small farmers. In Scotland at the top, most of the forests are held in huge land holdings by absentee landowners. Next. Next. Uh, in countries like Norway, um, this is a, a commune in Norway that I visited where uh, a quarter of a million acres of land is held by the commune. Next. Um, they have a population of 2,280. They have their own local government. They have their own bank. They own a quarter of a million acres of land. They have two sawmills and they have a house building factory. They basically don't know what to do. The, the problem in shock commune, they asked, I said, what's your problem? He said, we don't know what to do with our money. They've got too much money. Next. And one of the, the reasons for this is we've lost all kind of control and touch and understanding of who owns our land and who owns our land in our towns and in the countryside around the towns. And this wasn't the case 100 years ago. Lloyd George there in 1910 instituted a survey of all land in Great Britain and Ireland to impose a tax on it. And he produced these beautiful maps, and there'll be maps of Renton here, showing who owned everything. Now, this was all repealed in 1920, but in continental countries, my sister lives in Switzerland, you go into the local municipality and you can open the drawer. So you could go into the local office in rent and you could open the drawer and you could find out who owns everything. And that's been, these have been maps that have been existing since the medieval times. So people have got much more institutional awareness of their land and their environment about who owns it. They've got local control over decision making over that land. It's not a distant bureaucracy in a council or a private landowner in a big house. And they've got huge control over their money supply. They own their local banks and they raise their own taxes. So those are the kind of fundamental reforms we need to do if we want to recover a sense of place. A sense of place I think we all experience today we've lost uh, a sense of in many, many places. I think that is me. Done. Thank you very much. Sorry, I'm three minutes over. <laughs>